Okay, Ben Atkinson here, and I want to ask you three questions. What do you do when your bank account is minus $98? What do you do when you're supposed to be living a life of faith? And what do you do when your wife or your spouse needs to know God the Father loves them and cares about them? And they also need to know that you care about them. This is what we're going to talk about in this session. And I'm entitling this, what do you do when your bank account is minus $98? I know that seems like a strange, uh, strange title, but I want to go there. Before we do, I want to jump into the Bible. And I'm going to jump into Matthew chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, I want you to open with me. We're going to look at a story. And this is a story of faith. Look at Matthew chapter 2. Now, verse 1. Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the, the king. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So we know these are uh, magi. Actually, the word is magi, which is, it's actually a Persian word. So you're looking at people that are coming from, could this be from the area of Iran? Who knows? We, we're, we're, it's probably possible that these people were from these wise men were from that area. And so they're coming from the east. And they're asking this question, verse 2, Where is he who has been born of the Jews, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. So they were supposed to be very wise, wisest of the wise. And they're gazing at the stars. And they see that there is a, they're able to look at the stars. And they're able to understand that the king of all kings is being born. That is remarkable within itself due to the limited amount of technology that they had. Not just that, but the, the aspect, when was the last time you read your Bible and looked at the sky and tried to figure out the connection? Now, we're going to do this. I'll just give you a little bit of an understanding. We did this at Jesus' first coming. And actually, Revelation chapter 12 gives us insight that we're going to do this at his second coming. That's not for today's teaching, but it's very important. And so verse there, the verse two, they're coming, they're seeking. And this is what I want to jump in and say, they had a life of faith. And I want to challenge you, where is your life of faith right now? Where is my walk? Where is my life of faith? Verse three, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. So these wise men are coming through. They're seeking the king of all kings. And Herod's kind of like, wait, I'm king. What do you mean? Who's king? What's going on? So he's concerned about his own well-being. As the Psalm 2, kings of the earth are always concerned about their own power, their own prestige. Uh, there are some good kings. There are some compassionate kings. There are some godly women and men that are leading in the nations. But we know that this guy wasn't a godly person. Verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he inquired to them where the Christ was to be born. I think this is so amazing in the fact that God set it up where it was already written where his son would be born, where the Messiah, where the Mashiach would be born. However, at the same time, he's gathering everyone together. He's giving them a chance. God is giving the, the Jewish people a chance to seek him, to find him. Scripture is very clear. If you seek me, you'll find me. And so, verse 5, And they said to him, In Bethlehem, in Judea, for it is written, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler, a big R, that's a... It, that's a title, who will shepherd my people, Israel. And so it goes on to talk about the wise men and all that they did. And I want to just take a moment to look at this and say, wow, guess what's happening? These men took a journey of faith. Not only that, they spent a lot of money on this. They took time to say, we want to give of our time and our energy we are going to give that to see the first coming of Jesus. And I want to ask you, what would you have done at his first coming? Would you have gone on a long trip? 
would are you searching the scripture where would you have been found searching the scriptures would you have been found looking for him see not many people were searching for jesus at the first coming a lot of people were searching for what they wanted they wanted a, a ruler that could come and defeat the romans they wanted a ruler that would come and make Jerusalem great for their own sake, their humanistic efforts with God at the center of it, in their minds. And But how many would, would you have been searching for Jesus through the scripture? And when you found him, when you found that he, where he was going to be born, when you saw the sign, would you give of your time and your energy to be there when he came? Because Jesus said, hey, I'm coming again. Watch and pray. And it was exactly that same aspect of what the, 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 the wise men saw. It's that watch and pray. Watch, look at the heavens. Read the word of God. Dialogue with the Holy Spirit. Search for me. And then pray and spend time interacting where the gospel is being preached. And, and then he goes on in Matthew 25, he goes on, we see in Matthew 25, that it's being faithful as to, number one, have oil in your heart. That's that intimacy. That's the first commandment. And then number two, to be faithful with your talents. That's the second commandment, loving your neighbor as yourself. So my question to you is, what would you do with your time and energy? For me and my wife, what we did is, we wanted to give up everything that we could to seek him. Now, I don't want to, we're not heroes in this. We did it so reluctantly. It was so weak. When we ended up going to Bible college in the middle of the country at a day and night prayer center with an unaccredited Bible school, we went there because the Holy Spirit was directing us clearly. And so we went there saying, we're going to do this because God's asking this of us. But we need you to help us. And we really, if you've heard, you've watched some of these videos, you gotta, if you've watched them, you gotta look at the other ones and get the full story. But what happened was there came a time when we were serving and we were ministering that we were $98 behind. And I'm supposed to be the head of the household. I'm supposed to have a life of faith. I'm supposed to be able to trust in God. And I remember a person saying to me, someone who actually lived in the Holocaust, he was in the, he was in the, the concentration camp in Poland, and I believe it was Krakow, and he, he said to me, uh, if I understand correctly, he said if, where his location was, he said, I had to watch my mom go through such horrendous things just to keep me alive. And he said this to me, young man, either you have a life of faith or you don't. So first of all, I'm minus $98 in, in debt. Uh, and number two, I don't have faith. I, I'm realizing there's no faking it till you make it. I just don't have faith. And then my wife needs to know that God the Father cares about her, that he's a protector and a provider because her husband's standing up preaching it. But not only that, my spouse needs to know from my witness that God the Father protects and provides and cares for her. So what do you do? And, 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 and she needs to know that I care for her, that I'm doing everything I can. And so I'm saying, Lord, do you want me to run out and get a job? Do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do that? And honestly, I needed to be faithful to whatever the Lord asked me to do. But what God asked me to do was to go and sit in a prayer room and minister to him and serve the people that came at the conferences. And then he said he would provide. And this minus $98 was really uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for me because I'm not protecting my family. It was uncomfortable for me because I'm not providing. It was uncomfortable for me because my peers around me were saying, maybe there's something wrong. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe you need to do that. And, and I, had, I was just like, oh God, help. And I remember one day we were ministering at a conference. It was a long time. A lot was going on. We were, we were, uh, we had a, I remember we had a three day fast. So we did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We had a fast and we were working as hard as we could. 
And then after that, we had the, the uh, people came to the, the conference on Thursday. We had to minister for two days. Uh, we were working in the prayer rooms and the prophecy rooms, and we were encouraging people, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, edifying, exhorting, and comforting. We were doing the best we can to help these, these people and serve. And I remember it was a Saturday. And I said, I just can't go on anymore like this. The tension in my heart was so much. I said, I'm going to lock myself in a room and I'm just going to pray. So I locked myself in a side room and I just got down on my hands and knees and I just prayed. I said, I'm going to pray until, and I don't know how long I was there for, maybe an hour, maybe two. I, I don't remember. But what happened was someone slipped a check underneath the door and it was for $100. Now, nobody knew that I had this need of $98. So it's Saturday, so I rushed off to the bank and and I brought us up to plus $2. So that, that, was, that was helpful because at least I wasn't $98 uh, gone. You know, uh, but I was at least positive. So I'm, I'm thinking, okay, wh what can I do? And we, we did the best we can. We gave, we, we, you know, a little bit of money came in, a little bit. There was, but there wasn't a breakthrough. We had, honestly, our support was at $50 a month. Uh, some of the people were, there was, you know, people were saying a lot of stuff and I was at a really hard place. So a month goes by. And I remember my wife was hurting. I'll just be honest with you. It's it's hard when there's there's not that provision. And um, I was hurting and I'm wondering, have I made a mistake? What am I supposed to do? Well, and, and there's these doubts rolling through my mind. Did I really hear God? Did he really lead our family here? What what is happening? What is gonna happen? What is he doing? And why do I why am I, you know, what's going on? Lots of questions. And I remember another conference came up. So we faithfully, we would fast and pray three days before the conference. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the conference would start in the evening. We would serve the people the best we can. People, you know, about a thousand plus people would come from all over. So we were serving them. And I remember we got to the prophecy rooms again. And, and I remember saying, Lord, would you provide today? Like, I, I was like, Lord, please help. You don't have to, but if you could. And that's when I met this amazing young lady. Uh, she had just come off the mission field. And this lady wrote us a check. She, she found out we were missionaries. She found out we raised our own support without saying anything. She said, I'm no longer a missionary on the field. I'm going to give you my support money. I, it's $1,000 a month. And so she wrote us a check for $2,000 before the, for this month and the next month. And, and we were like, oh my gosh, the Lord has met us. I remember we went Sunday, we put the money in the bank, uh, put it in there. You know, we had like $1 to our name and we put this money in and we went home and we paid bills. Now, back in that day, you, you do these things called checks. I think some of you still know what they are. And if you bounced a check, it was like $29 extra you had to pay. So we wrote like five checks. Uh, paid our bills, put the 2000 in, paid the bills. Then you have to actually mail the bills, uh, send those bills in um, to get there on time. And so we were like, I can't believe it. Yes, thank you, God. We're going to pay for the electric. We're going to pay for the... And so we were paying these bills and we were so excited. And we were also getting robbed at that time. It was kind of weird. Someone was paying their cable bill. I mean, we didn't even have cable but they were using our bank account every month to pay their cable bill, like $78, my wife and I. We'd like, literally for like five months, our bank wouldn't do anything about it. It was the weirdest thing. And so we, that's a lot of why we were going in. Literally the devil was robbing us. And they were saying, the bank was saying, there's nothing we can do about it. And it was just weird. So long story, even longer, is this person, when she wrote this check, what happened was Wednesday morning, we start getting these minus 29, minus 29. And we end up getting all these bounce checks. Because here's what happened is our bank thought we were writing a false check. And uh, we were in the midst of writing that check. We were just trying because we were in such, you know, we we're in such a dire strait. We we're just like, let's write a false check. So they stop the account before they can verify it. And 
our bank and this person who gave us a $2,000 check, their bank didn't work together very well. So as a result, here I am like going, Lord, help. Now we're further in debt. Like, <laughs> ah, is this is how it's supposed to be. And, and I remember walking around and talking and saying, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need you to break in. And God did. Now, he didn't make it easier. He didn't just all of a sudden, poof, everything goes away. There was, there was no instant money you could get through these, you know, these cash apps that we have uh, today. So I had to sit back and say, Lord, if you are a father, help me. Like, I know you're my father, but my wife needs to know you're a good father. She needs to know you'll protect and provide for her. She needs to know. I need to know. She needs to know I'm going to care for her. I, I took a vow. I said I would provide for this person. This is your daughter. You know, and I'm, I, this is how my prayers were. And maybe you've got to a place. And we're going to turn this all back around to the Magi in a minute. And so I remember what happened is we finally went in and talked to the bank and they said, hey, we think that you're fraudulent. You wrote a fake check. We stopped your account, da, 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 da. Finally, she gets on the call. She talks to this bank in that where the money was, found out it was real. And she said, I'm so sorry. We'll take off all those, those, um, those uh, charges. We, you know, and so everything, she goes, but it's not going to be okay for a while. She's like, it's going to take like a week to get all this clear. So if you want any money, you've actually got to tell me right now. And I'll write, I'll, I'll get you money out of your account. And I said, right then and there, the Lord spoke to me. I don't claim to hear the Lord all the time. But he said inside my heart, don't take the money, I'll provide. And I remember my, I said, no, we don't need the money, God will provide. And just like before I could not say it, it just slipped out of my mouth. I remember my wife saying, honey, I think we've like tested God enough. And, and so, and she said, honey, we've got a meeting in an hour where we promised to pay lunch for this person and we need to pull this money out. And I was just like, nope, the Lord said it. And now what had happened, here's what had happened. Two things. Number one, the Lord was growing my faith that he was a provider. Now, it was through a way that I didn't understand, and it was a little bit hard, and I had to walk with him every step of the way. But he was showing me he's a, prov he's a provider, and he's showing me he cares about my heart. In the midst of the waiting, in the midst of every issue, in the midst of every circumstance, every the people stealing our money, the this happening, that happening, in the midst of it, he was growing my heart in love. He was telling a divine story. He didn't just snap his finger. He was winning my heart step by step. He was growing my heart in faith. And at the same time, he was growing my wife's heart in faith. He was encouraging her. He was strengthening her. He was building a story in her. He was capturing her and saying, you can trust me. And so we walked away from that meeting and the bank's like, the banker was like, hey, I think you should, you've tested God enough, you know, and she was kind of laughing and she looked at my wife like, are you serious? So speed things up. We go back and on our mailbox is a envelope was checked. Someone had sent overnight $500. God told me to send this to you. It was like the overnight and somehow they taped it to our mailbox. I mean, that's crazy. Someone could have just came up and walked away um, and took that money away. However, we drove right back to the bank and we showed the woman and she was so ecstatic, the banker. She made a copy of that and went and told stories to the other bankers. So the first testimony was God was winning my heart and my wife's heart. The second testimony was God was winning her heart and he was doing a witness and he was giving her a chance to respond. Let's back up to our story with the Magi. Now the Magi are in faith taking their time and their energy to go meet Jesus at the first coming. They're actually provoking King Herod. They're provoking the religious leaders of their day. They're provoking the people that were all around. They were provoking them by taking their wisdom and seeking the stars and the, and the, and the word of God to find out where 
the king of kings was supposed to be. See, they couldn't do it. The Magi couldn't do this without King Herod. They couldn't do it without the Jewish people. The Jews and Gentiles have to work together. Together, Paul specifically in Romans chapter 11, of 11, and I want to read this, but I want to talk about Ephesians 2. Paul talks about a time when Jew and Gentile will be coming together. He talks about a time when the Jew and Gentile must work together. Through the cross of Christ, we've been united for the kingdom of God going forward for such a time as this. In the same way with these magi, in the same way with the Jewish people in their day, the, the, the magi had to come and learn, where is the king supposed to be born? We have to learn. But yet at the same time, there's this provocation, this provoking. Paul says in Romans 11, 11, he says, I say then, have they stumbled, they should fall, speaking of the Jewish people, certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So I want to say this to you. What are you doing to watch right now for his second coming? Are you studying the word? Are you searching? Are you searching for him? Are you searching for him? Are you faithful? And do you understand the bigger story of God bringing Jews and Gentiles together and the provocation of Israel? I hope you do. If that's a new thing to you, I want to encourage you to read Romans 9, 10, and 11, and you'll see that the best is yet to come. Let me pray for your faith. Let me pray for my faith. Lord, I ask right now in Jesus' name that you would break in and you would speak. I am the Father who loves you. I am the Father who cares. I am the Father who will provide. Win our hearts again and again and again and help us grow and be faithful and watch as you come. God bless.